Aloha. Welcome to the Mr. G podcast. I am Mr. G. Thank you for joining me today from Honolulu, Hawaii. It is uh, Saturday, January 6, 2023. This is season two of the Mr. G podcast. Season one didn't have this nice of a camera, had a different background. Now I have a nice map background. Going to raise the seat a little bit. Now you can see a lot of me. You can see Mr. G's wingspan. Wimby ain't got nothing on me. Wimby ain't got nothing on Mr. G. You know, this uh, hater that walks around and gives me shit for feeding the cats, he's got little arms. His wingspan's like this. Mr. G's wingspan. Blocking shot, blocking shot, blocking shot. So you got all that now. And also, uh, it's great to be back here. I love doing this. It is a bit odd uh, to do something so unnatural, like talking in a quiet room by myself to a camera but have it come so naturally to me. And it does come naturally to me. You can say this and that, the haysayers, the haters, the naysayers, the uh, Twitter deleters, shout out to Drake, uh, the tweeter deleters, uh, the, uh, the, they, they, you can say what you want about the numbers. Oh, no one watches your podcast, this or that. I know I'm doing a great job. I know I really enjoy this. Uh, it's not necessarily a sports podcast, but we do talk about sports uh, because I talk about sports. It's 9.55 a.m. here in Honolulu, Hawaii, like I said, January 6, 2023. And uh, it's uh, a bit cool in here uh, by Hawaii standards, so I can shut the windows. And I'm going to be doing 50 episodes over the next two months. I've taken an extended break from the Mr. G podcast. I've been working more on my uh, Bible videos and my meme videos have been doing well on my main YouTube channel. I don't know where I'm going to upload this, but I am going to do 50 episodes over the next two months. In March, I have uh, other things planned and visitors coming here, so it's the best time. What's the temperature in Honolulu, Hawaii? It's 74 degrees in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, so that's actually cooler than it normally is. It was it maybe dipped below, if it ever dips below 70 Recently, the past few years, that's a benefit because it's been very hot in Hawaii. But yeah, I like the new background. Uh, I'm going to keep continue upgrading, continue building. What uh, people don't understand is that I'm growing every day. I'm not taking steps backwards. I'm only, only taking steps forward. I uh, created a, a really strong alliance uh, with a uh, famous live streamer. Shout out to Spidey Turin. And uh, we've been working together on different ideas. We have some plans coming up this year. And he's a really good person. I haven't had a friend as cool as him uh, in a very long time. So I really appreciate that. And I've been dealing with other things as well. But um, I, I got a lot going on. You wouldn't even believe it. But uh, we normally talk about sports here. And it's not hard to do this. There's no reason why I shouldn't have been doing this. There's no reason why I shouldn't write in my awesome journal every day because it only takes me a few minutes. I don't have to stop and think. The words just come, the pen just flows and it's Bukowski-esque. Uh, so, you know, the hardest thing about anything in life is just getting started. And that's the same thing with this podcast. You know, uh, at my old apartment, I did numerous recordings. That's where the Bible readings come from that I've been uploading every day on my different YouTube channels. But uh, I was able to do recordings all day and it wasn't a problem. I didn't uh, seem to be hassled or bothered. Uh, here it's a little bit more walking on eggshells, but I still have to do it. And when you look at it, it's only 20 minutes a day. Uh, like I said, it's almost 10 a.m. right now. So, we'll, you know, talk sports for about 10, 15 minutes. We'll talk about anything. This isn't a sports podcast. And I wouldn't recommend watching sports. I took a long break from watching basketball. It was my main sport, NBA basketball. And college football, I watched a little bit. This year, I watched a lot of college football. I was really into it because my University of Texas graduate, and they came so close to winning the championship. They came so close to at least going to the national championship game. And that last drive, uh, it was really good for me as well because I follow the universities and their academic programs. And the University of Texas and the University of Washington are two of the premier public academic institutions in the United States. The only one being uh, more accredited is University of Berkeley. And they haven't had a good football team in 50 years. <laughs> but uh, so it was really great seeing those two schools play each other, the University of Texas and the University of Washington. Uh, those are two of my favorite universities. Of course, I was cheering for the University of Texas because that's where I went to school. 
Um, and it was one of the best games. It came down to the final catch. Uh, the Longhorns were on offense. They were trying to throw a touchdown. They were down by six. If they would have caught it, they would have most likely won the game. Uh, there was actually pass interference on that last play. If you rewind it, uh, the defender for Washington, uh, he climbed on top of the receiver and batted the ball out, but he grabbed, definitely grabbed the receiver. And there were a lot of shady things going on in that game. I was watching it live from here in Hawaii, and it didn't end till about 8.30, 9 o'clock. And when it's 9 o'clock in Hawaii, it's 2 a.m. On, for two-thirds on the East Coast of the United States, for two-thirds of the United States. So that final drive, they didn't want to see overtime. They didn't want to see anything else. They just wanted to hurry up and wrap it up. The commercials needed to play. The local news needed to come on. And so that last drive, there was a lot of shady things that went on. I, was, I haven't heard anybody else mention, but there was some clock uh, shady mismanagement, sus management on that clock. Um, if I'm if, if I'm not mistaken, the rules in college football is the clock stops briefly after a first down. Well, that didn't happen for the Texas Longhorns on that last drive. And I watched the clock continue to roll. And also there was another play where the Longhorns um, obviously ran out of bounds where the clock was also supposed to stop and it didn't stop. It kept rolling. And so also the last catch as well, which people are going to analyze for years to come. And uh, it, it was it was hard to watch. Um, or it was it was great to watch. And uh, a lot of times in life, as Rosie Perez says in the famous movie, white men can't jump. Sometimes you lose when you lose, you really win. Sometimes when you win, you really lose. And sometimes when you win or lose, nobody wins or lose. And it's a tie. And a lot of times that happens in sports. I think about the San Antonio Spurs when they lost in the 2013 NBA finals, the only NBA finals that Tim Duncan ever lost in against the Miami Heat. Ray Allen hit a fadeaway three-pointer in game six. And uh, at the time, I, uh, my brother was very upset. He's like, I can't believe the Spurs lost. The Spurs lost. You know? And I'm like, no, it's just like Rosie Perez says. Sometimes when you lose, you really win. And what happened? The Spurs came back. They made it to the NBA Finals next year against the Miami Heat. And they produced some of the most beautiful basketball that's ever been seen. The 2014 NBA champion, San Antonio Spurs. They destroyed uh, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh in the NBA Finals. And the Spurs played as a team, as a unit. Kawhi Leonard won Finals MVP. And so they wouldn't have come back so strong uh, next year in 2014 if they hadn't lost so heartbreaking in 2013. So when you, uh, that's life, uh, you know, summed up, um, you know, when you go through life and you have setbacks, you want to learn from them. Uh, they're, if you don't learn from them, then they're regrets. They're not experiences. So you always want to learn from your experiences. And basketball, like soccer, is a great analogy for life. But um, so with the Texas Longhorns, like I said, they had a great season. At the beginning of the season, they were 25 to 1 odds to win the college football championship. They were like 15 to 1 odds even to make the college football playoff. And I looked at their schedule at the beginning of last season and I said, hey, the Longhorns play uh, 10 of their 12 games on Texas soil. And so uh, I said that the only tough game they have is Texas is, is at Iowa state, which they blew out Iowa state and at Texas tech, which they also uh, blew out Texas tech. But next year is a different story. Next year, the Longhorns is the first year for them in the sec, the most powerful conference in college football. And the Texas Longhorn football team have the most difficult schedule any college football team has ever had. And I'll, and I'll put up that argument if you disagree with me. The Texas Longhorn football team. Come on. Got this freaking pop-up at, all right, they start off the season against Colorado State. That's easy. All right, it's just a warm-up game. But then their second game of the year is at Michigan at the big house, Michigan is playing Washington in the national championship. If you were going to play one of the toughest teams in the, in the, in the United States for the second game of the season, it's Michigan, right? So that's their second game. Then they play UTSA university of Texas, San Antonio. They've had a, a division one football team for about 20 years. This is one of their first times they they get to play the Longhorns. So that's not an easy W UTSA is a good team. They're going to give them all. Then they play ULM Warhawks. Okay. I think that's University of Louisiana Monroe. Okay, that's also an easy game. Then Mississippi State, all right, at, at home. But Mississippi State is an SEC team. That's not a gimme. 
Then it's the Red River Shootout in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl versus Oklahoma. Oklahoma has a Heisman candidate. He's, I guess, a sophomore next year. I saw him play in the bowl game. He's a great player, a great quarterback, and a great, exciting player. Next up, they got Georgia. Georgia might be the best football team in the United States. They won 27 games straight up until they lost to Alabama, right? Oh, Alabama? Yeah, Texas plays them as well. They play Georgia, then they play at Vanderbilt, then they play Florida, also very strong, very good SEC team. Then they play at Arkansas, which I'm not mistaken, has two Heisman candidates coming up this year, a running back and a quarterback. Okay, that's a tough game. Then they play Kentucky. Everybody's talking about Kentucky football. You know, Usually basketball is what Kentucky Wildcats are known for. But the last year or two, it's Kentucky football, and they're licking their chops getting to play the Texas Longhorns. And then they play Texas A&M. And I know they play Alabama next year. The, the, for for some reason, it's not even on here. That's crazy. They play Texas A and M. Maybe they don't play Alabama. Maybe they played Alabama the first uh, last year. But I, I don't know for, for what it says here on FBS schedules, which is usually pretty accurate. It looks like that they they've taken that Alabama game off of Texas schedule. And that's that's interesting. That helps out the Longhorns, and that helps out Alabama. If you want to say the top five football teams in the United States, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Washington, um, Ohio State, probably. And uh, most of those teams are, are southern states. I took a class at uh, the University of Texas called Southern America, and the topic of college football came up. There's like hundreds of people in this class. And uh, uh, for some reason, I was talking and I, I said, college football, it's it's more passionate in the South. Here, there's better teams. There's better people that are interested in it. There's more people that, that, that go to the games. And the, the professor was the, the TA teaching this particular class. He was arguing with me. It's like, yeah, I don't think people up in the Northeast would agree with you or the people in the, the Northwest either. But then it's like, so I could see some of the football fans in the in the class, like frat boys and stuff, looking at me like, yeah, he's right. You know, and it is. Anybody that knows football, the Southeast Conference, the Southern United States is the best college football. Now you have University of Texas in the SEC, Oklahoma in the SEC, Alabama in the SEC, Florida in the SEC, uh, Ole Miss in the SEC, Arkansas in the SEC, Mississippi State in the SEC. Vanderbilt and the SEC um, it's 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 by far and I'm, I'm missing out on a bunch of other good teams as well it's by far the best conference and also South Carolina and the SEC one reason why college football is more popular because it's a business all right college football it's it's similar to pro football where it makes so much money more people go to college football games than they do pro NFL games and and if you look at these these big schools these big college football programs that I mentioned Alabama, there's not a professional sports team in the state of Alabama. Their professional sports team is Alabama, South Carolina. They don't have a professional sports team. Their professional sports team is either Clemson or South Carolina. Who else? Uh, you look at anywhere in the South, Mississippi, the poorest state in the United States, Old Miss uh, or Mississippi State. These, these places in the South, uh, these states, they don't have uh, Georgia, you know, has Atlanta. But other than that, uh, you know, th these states, their, their uh, college football team acts as a pro football team. So that's what sells. That's what people are wearing around. They're wearing Alabama shirts, Alabama caps. You know, if there was a pro team that they would win that. And so pro teams only go to bigger cities. Uh, you look at Austin, Texas is a great example. Austin is one of the biggest cities in the United States without a professional sports team. I think they have a soccer team now or something like that. But any of the major sports teams for so long, they didn't have a sports team despite having a large population. And the reason why is because the University of Texas has so much clout in Austin. They don't want to see another football team take away and sell their you know, football hats and football shirts. They don't want a basketball team taken away from people watching UT basketball. UT acts as the professional team in the city of Austin. And if you look at their sports cast, you know, normally big cities that, you know, when you get to the sports, they'll play. If it's in New York, they'll say, oh, New York sports, the New York Mets, the New York Knicks, the New York Nets, the Brooklyn Nets. And they'll talk about local sports. And Austin newscasts, 
do what what do they do when they talk about sports they talk about the university of texas sports even if it's the swim team or the volleyball team same in hawaii the university of hawaii that acts as a pro team for the uh, state of hawaii because there aren't any professional sports teams in the state of hawaii so when you get to the local newscast on hawaii it's like you know oh the men's volleyball team or uh, the women's uh, gymnastics. No, they don't do women's gymnastics, but but it's all like global sports, and uh, and that's good in a way, and that's one reason why I like college football, and I don't watch NFL football. Um, there's there's a lot more that goes into college football, and like I said, the university that I graduated from, the university that I wrote a book about, Gonzo Education, was playing for a chance in the championship game. I went to one of the top premier graduated from and wrote a book about one of the top premier universities in the world so of course i'm going to follow it somewhat but i don't recommend following sports and this isn't a sports podcast i took some time off from watching sports i watch basketball nba basketball almost every year for decades since about 1989 religiously and then COVID came around and it just messed everything up. And I was just like, I, I just, I can't be asked. And um, the, what the NBA did with putting slow woke slogans on the back of their jerseys and having TVs in the crowd instead of fans and playing like all the games in the same arena and like giving the championship to LeBron James. And I just, it, it just, uh, uh, you know, revealed the magician behind the curtain and I, I just couldn't, and, and I realized a lot of why I liked NBA basketball is because the crowd is right there, right there on the court. It's because they have the loud noises. It's because of the jumbotron. It's because of everything else. When it's just two, 10 guys playing basketball, it's like, oh, this is just some dudes playing hoops. Why was I so into this for so many years? spending hours and hours of my life watching basketball, something that has very little significance to my own life. So that's why college football, the University of Texas, it does have some significance into my life because I wrote a book about the University of Texas and graduated from there. But other than that, uh, you know, normally, unless you're betting on the games, unless you're, uh, very few people actually get to play in like in the top professional sports leagues, everybody thinks that they can do it. If you put your mind to it, you can do anything. And that might be possible, that might be true to some extent. But why do people stop watching sports? Well, for different reasons. Some common ones are they, they need more time, energy, money, and personal growth. And I see that as well. When I stopped watching basketball in 2020, I, I was like, okay, this is good. I don't know why I watch so much basketball. And I'll probably never watch as much NBA basketball as I used to. But other people feel that watching sports takes too much time and energy away from their own lives and goals. Others may find sports too expensive to follow or attend. Some people may also lose interest in sports as a form of distraction or escapism. Well, NBA basketball, the most watched NBA finals of all time was 1998 the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan's last championship, his last year versus the Utah Jazz. And I think maybe 50, 60 million people watch that. And it's down to like 5 million or less than that. It's down to a, a, a small percentage of what it was in 1998, 25 years ago. And most of those people that watched Michael Jordan in the flu game in 1998 um, hit a game-winning shot over Byron Russell most of the people who watch that, they're still around. They didn't go anywhere, but they just stopped watching basketball. And what, it, what, what has changed? A lot has changed. What has mostly changed in the NBA? Uh, players, even the, the, the bench players, are given an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, the power is no longer in the owners or the managers or even the coaches' hands. It's more in the players' hands. And LeBron James is uh, one of the main uh, individuals responsible for that. He had that whole idea where they changed up the all-star game. So it wasn't East versus West anymore. It was uh, two team captains and then you get to pick the teams. And so somebody's already always picked last. And they did that for like five, 10 years just to, you know, please LeBron. 
And now they're switching it back to East versus West, which is what the traditionally was for like a hundred years. Uh, but, you know, LeBron James did do some interesting things. He made it where it was okay for, uh, you know, players to switch teams, which, which is good. You know, people like to see, they like to see super teams. They like to see uh, their favorite all-stars. That's why people watch the all-star game because all their favorite players are, are, um, are together. But um, speaking of all stars, let's uh, let's check the uh, latest uh, all star standings, huh? Or no, it's not because I don't have it on the But but um, I'll give you my all star picks. But why why do people stop watching sports? Although why do people just not watch sports in general? You know, some people they could be the most open minded people in the world. And a lot of my friends throughout my life were not the type of people to like sports, you know, people that like to read, uh, that like to um, use their mind. And, um, you know, I'm just generating some AI uh, results. Why, why do people not like sports and people do like sports? Some people choose not to enjoy sports for various reasons. One reason is commitment involved. Sports fans often invest emotionally in their favorite teams. They celebrate victories and feel disappointed when their team loses. However, not everyone wants to dedicate time and energy to this level of commitment. The intense emotions and rivalries associated with sports can be overwhelming for some individuals. And uh, yeah, you give what you take. Uh, my team, the San Antonio Spurs, I celebrated uh, five championships and, uh, a lot, and I had a lot of heartbreak loss as well. Uh, number two, constant headlines. Sports news is hard to avoid. It's everywhere on TV, social media, and even casual conversations. For those uninterested in sports, the constant exposure to sports headlines can be tiresome or even annoying. One tidbit about this that I've learned is sometimes in life you're in a situation where you're going to have to make small talk with people. And sometimes that's hard to do because there's very few universal topics. It's like, oh, we can talk about the weather and people do do that. Oh, what's the weather? Like I do that. Everybody does that. But the second number two after weather is sports. Sports is a universal is almost as universal as the weather. And I, a lot of lower economic uh, people watch sports. So if you ever find yourself in a, in a situation, a, a, a wealthy stockbroker finds himself in the in the drunk tank of the local jail. Right. Uh, and everybody's sobering up and he wants to make friends or have conversation and they don't know much about stocks or bonds, but they know about sports. And so one thing the Wall Street banker can talk about is sports. And that's the same situation of any person. If you're used to, you know, a higher level of, of, of people that don't watch sports like I am, sometimes you'll find yourself in a situation where you uh, sports are your as your biggest ally and can be your biggest friend and they can open doors for you. Um, so it's, it's good. It's never good in life to just block things out and just to say, no, no, that's not for me. I don't like it. I don't like it. it Maybe a few like very nefarious things, but something like sports that's so universally, uh, appreciated. It's not something that I would ever recommend just, oh, I'm not, I'm not, not sports guy. I'm not sports. I'm not sports. You want to be open-minded to everything. That's the mindset that you want to take. If you want to be, um, youthful and, uh, have, have vir virality not virality, if you want vitality um, throughout your life, you know, not many uh, people my age are as young as I am. And one reason why is because I have an open mind. And so people are like, oh, I don't like sports, not for me, not for me. You wanna keep an open mind anything. It's very hard to convince those people. And if there's anything, it's basketball or soccer that would do it, if any sport, football, it's way too complicated. Rugby, I don't even know. Cricket, I don't even know. But uh, American football, it's way too complicated. It takes a while to learn it. Soccer and basketball is the most easiest to learn. And also um, the best thing about sports and NBA basketball is there's all this drama on the side. And same with soccer, the World Cup, uh, all the different countries play each other. There was a match coming up that I thought was real. It was Palestine versus Israel in a soccer preliminary match for the World Cup. So that's just an example, the, the most extreme example of the underlining uh, storylines that are involved with international soccer and with sports in general. Basketball and soccer are both analogies um, for success, for achieving your goals. Football, American football, it's an analogy for war, which, which is also very interesting as well.
But what are some other reasons people don't like sports? Lack of interest in the games. Some sports games may seem repetitive or too long without enough action. For example, baseball games involve players running around bases and basketball games can have tense moments only in the final periods. Not every sport offers the excitement of wrestling or fast paced action. And like I said, the NBA playoffs in 2020 during COVID, uh, that, that was kind of a disgrace. And it, when it, if you take the announcers out of it, one reason why they have announcers calling all the play by plays is because it makes it more exciting. Try watching a basketball game with the volume off and it's not as good. And, um, you know, when you don't have the extra, um, the extra stimulation, the, the product isn't as, as good as well. And so that's why they had all those TVs in the seats. That's why they had all the names on the back of the jersey. They, they just thought they had to add something because they didn't have the crowd. They didn't have the environment. And uh, that's, a, that's a lot of the facade of sports. Complex rules. This is like American football. Understanding the rules of certain sports can be challenging. Imagine watching a basketball game where players use their hands and suddenly the referee stops play due to a travel violation. For non-sports enthusiasts, these abstract rules might seem confusing and uninteresting. Negative health effects. While not a common reason, some people avoid sports due to concerns about permanent damage from playing sports, such as concussions in American football or addiction associated with sports participation. And also you look at the, the majority of people that watch sports, they're not necessarily my type of people. <laughs> hey, thank you for listening about sports, but hey, I don't like you. We're not friends, okay? <laughs> Seriously, uh, the people that I've generally always been friends with, like I said, were the people that did not like sports. And so, and they're surprised. They're like, you like sports? Like, I'm like, no, no, no. I just like, and I have to explain to them. No, no, no. <laughs> I like it for symbolic reasons. Uh, and I only like like college football, like I've explained to this podcast, college football because of the University of Texas and because I follow different schools and universities and um, uh, college, excuse me, college football and professional NBA basketball uh, because of how it's a metaphor for uh, life. But also uh, it's it's exciting to watch, uh, you know, you're you right there, you can see the players' faces, unlike in other sports, you're either at a bird's eye angle in soccer or in American football, they have this huge helmet on their head. So in basketball, it's a team game, but there's also individual parts. Like, you know, sometimes a, a player gets to take a free throw. So when I've been watching sports in the past with somebody that doesn't like sports, like a girl or girlfriend or a woman I'm on a date with, um, I'll, I'll try to um, initiate something about the, the game that's not about the game that could interest the person. So I was once um, dating a Canadian woman and we we're watching the Phoenix Suns with Steve Nash playing. She's like, oh, no, I don't want to watch basketball. I'm like, oh, this guy's uh, he's the MVP and he uh, is from Canada. And she's like, oh, really? Canada? What's his name? Steve Nash. Oh, and then it gets her him interested in in basketball. You know, you see the players and uh, even though it's a team game, there are different individual parts to it. And you got to admit this year in, in NBA basketball has been one of the best years uh, ever in NBA basketball. Two of the best rookies that have ever played in the NBA, Chet Holmgren and Wimby, Victor Wimbanyamba. They're both well over seven feet. They both can shoot the three. They both can take you off the dribble. They both are skinny as fuck. And um, they're both uh, awesome to watch, awesome to play. About a week ago, Chet Holmgren seen, uh, did it. I saw a highlight that I've never seen anybody do in a regular basketball game. And uh, he had the ball and he was dribbling. Then he lost his dribble. So you're like, oh, no, it looks like he's going to turn it over. But then he takes the ball and he bounces it off the backboard to himself and gives himself an alley-oop. Boom, and dunks it in. I've never seen that. I've seen that in an all-star game. I've never seen that in a regular basketball game. And he did that because it was the right basketball move. It was the smart play. And it, uh, it helped their team. So I'm like, wow, I've never seen that. Chet Holmgren's better than I thought. And then the next, uh, a, a few days later, Victor Wembanyama, the San Antonio Spurs, same thing. He's dribbling the ball. He puts two hands on the ball. He loses his dribble. You think he's about to turn it over. And then he bounces off the backboard and dunks it to alley-oops it to himself, just like Chet Holmgren, except even better. And so it's like, whoa, 
Hey, Chet, that's a rivalry right there. Chet Holmgren does something that nobody else has ever done. Wimby three days later does the same thing, except does it better. I mean, you, you got to love that. They're going to play each other for the next 20 years. And they both deserve Rookie of the Year. I would not be surprised if they have a duel, a tie for Rookie of the Year this year, and they give it to Wimby and Chet Holmgren because they both deserve it. They're both leading the league in blocks. As far as the stats go, okay, Wimby is act, uh, averaging 3.2 blocks a game. Chet, 2.6 blocks a game. But Chet is more efficient. He's only having one and a half turnovers per game, where Wimby is averaging over three turnovers a game. Steals, Victor has uh, Chet beat. Steel. Victor averages about one and a half steals a game, and Chet is just under a steal per game. Rebounds, Victor hasn't beat. Victor averages 10 boards a game. Chet averages seven boards a game. Points per game, Victor's averaging just under 20 points a game. And Chet is averaging uh, just under 18 points a game. Chet's played in 33 games. Wimby's played in 30 games. So the season, it's more than a third of the way done, not counting the playoffs, the regular season, 30 games in of an 82-game season. And uh, you really see the future of the NBA. Uh, a lot of the stars of old, are, are, are no pun intended, but they're old uh, and they're not going to be playing much longer. You have LeBron James at uh, 39 years old. You have uh, Steph Curry at 37 years old. Uh, uh, how old is Kevin Durant? I, I went to school with Kevin Durant in 2006 and he was 18. Uh, so 2006, that was uh, 18 years ago. <laughs> So, uh, wow, it's been a while, Kevin Durant. You've been uh, you've been a famous basketball player for a long time now, for half your life, for 18 years almost. So uh, the new stars are coming in, uh, like Halliburton for Indiana, or um, who else do we have? Halliburton for Indiana. Let, let's let's check the uh, latest All Star votes so far. Halliburton. Uh, I think LeBron James, uh, well, uh, you got the Greek freak. Giannis is still doing really good. Uh, Joel Embiid is still young. Um, All-star votes so far. But yeah, uh, the Mr. G podcast is available wherever you receive your podcasts. Uh, Amazon podcast, Apple podcast is the best place. And their episode, their the video, uh, the audio is uploaded on Amazon. Audacity, uh, Spotify, and uh, the videos are uploaded in their entirety on Twitter and on YouTube as well. So LeBron James and uh, Giannis are the two biggest vote getters. You, LeBron James has two million votes, um, and Giannis has like one and a half million. So in the West front court top five, we got LeBron James two million votes, Kevin Durant with one point eight million. Like I said, they won't be around for much longer. Number three, Nikola Jokic, probably the best player in the NBA, probably the best big man that has ever played. This is the first time I've mentioned his name today, uh, but he does not get his enough credit. It's good to see he's third in voting. Anthony Davis of the Lakers is fourth. Kawhi Leonard of the Clippers is five. As far as the backcourt in the West, Luka Doncic, the Mavericks, number one. Steph Curry, number two. Shea Guild, Chris Alexander. He's... Uh, third in MVP uh, tracker right now. You may not have heard of him. Oklahoma City does not get many games nationally televised, but SGA is probably <clears throat> uh, the best uh, point guard in the NBA, other than Luka Doncic. All right, to the East top vote getters, we have Giannis, the Bucks with 2.1 million. Then we got Joel Embiid at the Sixers with 1.8 million. Jason Tatum, 1.7 million. Jimmy Butler and Jalen Brown, uh, Jimmy Butler of the Heat, one of my favorite players, just under a million votes. The backcourt, Tyrese Halliburton leads the way with 1.3 million. Damian Lillard, just under a million. Trey million. Uh, Trey Young, just under a million. Donovan Mitchell, uh, 600,000. And Tyrese Maxey of the Sixers is number five in the entire Eastern Conference with all star vote getters. <clears throat> that just goes to show, uh, show you uh, how moving one player, James Harden, to the Clippers uh, can change Maxi's whole uh, routine. He was a bench player last year, and now he's an all-star this year. So the smallest changes can uh, really uh, have an impact. 
And that's not just in basketball, that's in life. You know, Jordan Peterson says, uh, if you're a messy person, if your whole room is a mess, if your whole house is a mess and you can't motivate yourself to clean it, convince yourself to clean one drawer, all right? Open one drawer. Can you do that? Can you open one drawer and clean that one messy drawer? Oh, yeah, I guess I can do that. Okay. Well, after you clean that drawer, you may think, hey, that wasn't so bad. Maybe I'll clean another drawer and another drawer. Maybe I'll clean the tabletop. Hey, maybe I'll move those newspapers over there. And it's just the, the hardest thing about just getting started. I haven't done this podcast in uh, very few episodes in the last month, but I know all you have to do is start and uh, it just comes back to you. You might think you're going to forget how to ride a bike, but you're not. It will come back to you. So uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you uh, for joining me today, uh, later, tomorrow. Uh, we're we're going to be doing this every day. All right. I don't care if nobody watches. I don't care if everybody watches. I'm doing this, all right? I'm doing it for me. And uh, we'll talk something not about sports tomorrow. We'll talk about something else in the next episode. Thank you for listening. Aloha.